So, good morning, everybody, or good evening, everybody, depending on which side of the earth you're on. Uh, this is our 20th global online seminar in biodiversity informatics. Um, I am very, very pleased to say to you all today, sorry, this is me talking, I'm very pleased to say to you all today that by popular demand, which is to say by suggestion of one of the students at our last uh, biodiversity informatics training curriculum um, course, there was the request for some, some historical perspective on the field of biodiversity informatics. And so I'm trying to give you that. And to that end, I have asked three per personalities uh, who've been very, very important to this field uh, to give seminars on the history of this endeavor. Uh, first is Arthur Chapman. Next month will be Jorge Soberon. And the third month will be John Wachorek. And they'll give you kind of the early, middle, and late periods of uh, of biodiversity informatics. So this is a three-part series, and I'll hope, I hope you will join us for all three parts. Today, I have the very distinct pleasure of welcoming Arthur Chapman. Uh, I'd like to give Arthur a very big thank you for, for assenting to do this seminar. Uh, I think he is literally uniquely uh, qualified to give this perspective, so I'm really happy that he's with us. Um, Arthur was, in the past, the assistant director of the Environmental Resources Information Network in the Australian government. He served as a visiting professor at the University of Campinas in, in Brazil. And he presently works as an environmental consultant. Uh, many of you will know him for the three reports that he did for, uh, for GBIF, which are now translated into multiple languages. Um, topics like principles of data quality, uh, methods of data cleaning, and uses of biodiversity data. Um, but Arthur has um, a very, very unique perspective, having been on the ground and in the trenches at the birth of this field in which we're working. So Arthur, thank you so much for, for uh, agreeing to do this seminar. Uh, everybody, I'm going to put up an email address right now. Um, that is the email address to which you can send questions. So Arthur's going to start into his seminar, and I hope that you will send him questions during the seminar so that I ha can have questions ready for him uh, when he finishes. So please, again, it's biodivtraining at gmail.com, but please uh, indeed send your your questions and comments that you would like him to respond to uh, while he's speaking. And then at the end, I will pass the questions on to him. So Arthur, thank you very, very much for doing this talk. And uh, the, the screen or the, the channel is all yours. So again, thanks a lot. And here you go. Thanks, Tan. Thanks, Tan. Have you got me there now? Yes, you're online. You're doing great. Okay, thanks, Town, particularly for introducing um, this series of talks. Uh, I think it's uh, quite timely that they we have a series of talks like this now. Um, welcome to everybody that's listening, uh, either live or we'll be viewing this on YouTube later. Now, I'm going to try and switch over to my slides. Uh, that's the one. That looks good, Arthur. Now that doesn't have my notes on it. It looks just fine. I can see your final slides. Okay, the first slide of your final slides. Yeah. Okay. Biodiversity informatics involves the use of modern technologies to convert the vast amount of data on biodiversity that exists in the world to knowledge, wisdom, and environmental outcomes. To quote Chris Dawker and Humphreys, biodiversity informatics describes a new synthetic discipline 
that integrates biological research, computational science and software engineering to deal with biotic data, their storage, integration, retrieval and use in analysis, prediction and decision making. From oceans of data, we get rivers of information, streams of knowledge, and eventually drops of understanding or wisdom, a quote from Henry Nix in 1990. Of course, this is an ever-changing field as technologies continue to improve. When I first became involved in this field, computing and databasing was extremely crude. GIS software, GIS software was all command line driven. There were no personal GPS machines. Georeferencing involved extracting paper maps from huge filing cabinets. Mobile phones and mobile phone apps didn't exist. Photography was still in the analog age and there was no World Wide Web, Google or Wikipedia. Some taxonomists of course were databasing the collections of taxa they were researching using spreadsheets or small databases. But these were generally only being done to aid them in their own taxonomic endeavors of describing species, species, writing floras and faunas and monographs. Little thought was given to any bigger picture use of the information. Indeed, one taxonomist told me that herbarium information was only of any use to taxonomists and nobody was interested in the accuracy of the latitudes and longitudes. In fact, many saw no use in having the coordinates at all, as long as they had a textual description of the location. In discussing early innovations of biodiversity informatics, <coughs> I see three key periods or eras. Of course, there is a lot, a lot of overlap. The first of these I'm calling the initiation era. It saw the beginning of the bringing together of ideas and the initiation of a number of national and subnational projects. The second era, the data and tools era, the 1980s, was a period when databases and desktop, desktop computing allowed many of these earlier projects to come to fruition and to expand. It was a period that saw the beginning of modeling and analysis tools. It saw the early development of important standards. And it saw discussions on development of national biological surveys and information networks. And it saw the initiation of ideas for global collaboration. The third era is the collaboration and expansion era, the 1990s. This was the period when biodiversity informatics became a true discipline. It was a period when national data networks were established. It was a period that saw the expansion of the internet and the development of the World Wide Web which allowed for widespread collaborations and made distributed databasing and analysis possible. It was a period that saw modeling and analysis tools come into widespread use. It was a period when standards for data interchange and data recording, as well as data analysis became universally accepted. And probably most importantly, it was a period when many important global collaborations emerged. It was estimated that less than 17% of the world's biodiversity had been described in the first 250 years of scientific endeavor. And at that rate of description and documentation, it would take another 500 years before 50% of the world's biodiversity was described. While in the meantime, many of those would already have become extinct. As a result, many were seeing our science progressing far too slowly and we're looking for faster and better ways to move forward. Questions were being asked by politicians as to why we were spending vast amounts of money on museums in Herbaria with little obvious benefit to the community. In 1970, the Australian Academy of Sciences held a series of lectures to commemorate the voyage of Captain Cook on his scientific voyage of discovery to Australia 200 years previous. One of the speakers was the distinguished botanist from the British Museum of Natural History, Professor William Stern. Stern spoke of the conspicuous absence of a modern Australian flora and the need for one, the last being written by George Bentham in the 1860s. He was later approached by Sir Maurice Morby of the mining giant Consingria Tinto, a fellow of the Academy, who discussed the possibility of raising private funds for such a venture. Following on from this, in February 1971, a meeting was held in Canberra to discuss the development 
of an information retrieval base for the information held on herbarium labels. This was followed in May by the 43rd Australian and New Zealand Association for the Advancement of Science Congress in Brisbane, where three proposals were submitted. From these, it was agreed that the best use of the funds would be for an index of Australian plant names. Australian plant name index then commenced in April of 1973 under the auspices of the late Nancy Burbage. And after a short period of work with a bibliographer, I was appointed to work on the project in January of 1974. Also in 1973, following extensive lobbying from the Academy and others, the Australian Government established an Interim Council of the Australian Biological Resources. ABRS was formally launched in 1976 under the, director under the directorship of WDL Ride, and in subsequent years took over the management of the Australian Plant Name Index, began the flora of Australia and the fauna of Australia, and developed an index to animal names, the Zoological Catalogue of Australia. The two indexes, the Australian Plant Name Index and the Zoological Catalogue, formed the great basis for later collections databasing as names form the central core of any such database. Meanwhile, the 1970s saw similar initiatives beginning in other parts of the world. In Mexico, Arturo Gomez Pompa and later Jose Suracan began a project to computerize the collections of the National Herbarium of Mexico <coughs> using ad hoc software that later morphed into the software Biotica. As early as the 1960s, Gomez Pompa had been active in computerization of biodiversity, compiling a database of the native plants of the Mexican state of Veracruz. And in 1979, Gomez Pompa, along with Giddings and others, initiated bioclimatic profiling for the Flora of Veracruz project. In 1971, the Queensland Herbarium in Australia initiated Herbrex, a database of label information from specimens. Initially using an automatic paper punching typewriter, this database became fully operational by 1981, and by 1991 included over half a million records. The first attempt to interchange data between biological databases began between 1973 and 1978. The Australian Biotop Biotaxonomic Information System, ABIS, had been established by ABRS to, quote, manage the storage and retrieval of information on the identity and recorded locations of Australian animals and plants. ABIS was intended to operate as a distributed database and was decades ahead of its time. Another project initiated by ABRS in 1976 was a targeted grant scheme, the ABRS Participatory Programme. Early grants included funding of about $100,000 a year for databasing efforts in the museums and herbaria. This was quite a revolutionary grant scheme at the time, as although competitive, it was targeted to identified priorities. Arising out of that, in 1979, the first biodiversity data interchange standards were published. These were two enable institutions to interchange data in machine readable form, including a geocoding system, which also allows integration of location data with other computer stored information, for example, on physical parameters such as soils and climate. Such climate databases were being developed at the time by CSIRO and were the forerunner of databases such as ANUCLIM and WorldClim, etc. Of course, databases were limited at the time and required fixed fields, often with a maximum length of 128 characters. So this then brings us to the second period, which I've called the data and tools era. The 1980s saw further developments in Australian databasing of collections as more and more museums in Herbaria began their databasing projects. The ABRS set priorities to fund all the vertebrates, except birds, in the Australian museums, as well as a number of important plant groups. Meanwhile, innovations were happening in other areas of biodiversity informatics, particularly in the development of tools and the analysis of the information. 
Firstly, under the auspices of CSIRO and later the Centre for Resource and Environmental Studies at the Australian National University, a team of scientists under the direction of Professor Henry Nix were developing species modelling software. Following the release of version one of BioClim in 1984 by Henry Nix and John Busby, early published applications utilised collection data from museums and herbaria in Australia <coughs> that had been funded by ABRS and from around the world and linked it to environmental information to predict the distributions of Australia's elaborate snake species, southern beech, nothophagus cunninghamii vegetation, mangrove species in Australia, species of the genus Banksia, as well as vascular plant genera in the Northern Territory. These were published at half a degree grid resolution, which was the best resolution climate and environmental data available on a continental scale at the time. <coughs> in 1974, Mike Dalwitz from the Australian National University had released the first version of his Delta Description Language for Taxonomy software for coding taxonomic descriptions. In 1980, Dalwitz released the InkKey edition for developing automated keys. The software came into general use around about 1984 when ABRS organised a series of workshops on its use and on the release of improved user guides. It is still in widespread use today, for example, with the flora of China. In 1984, the Delta format was adopted by Tadwig as a standard for data interchange of descriptive data. The 1980s and 1990s, excuse me, saw the expansion of the importance of the Taxonomic Databases Working Group as a standard setting organisation. Early standards were largely paper-based, but towards the end of the 1980s, new standards emerged that involved data interchange. These included the Delta format mentioned earlier for descriptive data and the HISPID standard for, tax for specimen data. HISPID, Herbarium Interchange Standards and Protocols for the Interchange of Data, was a comprehensive standard initially intended for data interchange, but ended up playing a hugely important role in the design of databases, not only for herbaria, but also for a number of museums. Further interchange standards were developed in the 1990s, but more on those later. The 1980s then saw the beginning of software to aid in specimen data entry. At the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of Oxford, researchers developed BRAMS, Botanical Research and Herbarium Management System, releasing their first version in 1985. The MUSE database management system was first developed by Julian Humphreys at the University of Michigan in 1987 for databasing fish, fish specimens and were, was released by Cornell University about 1991. This software later morphed into ZOE and then specify at the University of Kansas. In Mexico, version one of Biotica was released by Canabio in 1995. Herbert was released in, released in Spain in 1994, and Biotica, an important one, was developed by Robert Colwell at the University of Connecticut. It was first published in 1996, but had been in use since 1992 for the arthropods of La Selva in Costa Rica. BioLink was released in Australia by CSIRO in 1998 and was initially used exclusively for entomological collections. But many institutions developed their own database management software, such as the University of California Davis Herbarium Database Management System, Herbrex mentioned earlier, Harvard University's Herbarium Manager, SMASH at the University of California, and many others. Other software such as Mantis and KENU came along much later. The 1980s also saw the first stages of large global collaborations. At the Tadwig meeting in Geneva in 1985, there was a discussion on what technical requirements and standards were required for the sharing of biodiversity related data on a large scale. This was taken up by the International Union for Biological Sciences and was later discussed at a number of subsequent meetings around the world. At the national level, discussions were being held on collaborative projects and the seed sown for what developed in the 1990s into full-blown biodiversity informatics projects and collaborations. 
1985, community he hearings organised by the ASC were held in the USA on the development of a national biological survey. A report, Biological Survey for the Nation, was published in 1993. In 1989, Aaron, uh, in Australia, the Environmental Resources Information Network was established and in, an INBIO was established in Costa Rica in the same year to support efforts to meet the country's biodiversity and to promote its sustainable use. So that brings us to the third period, which I've designated the collaboration and expansion era. It is the period when biodiversity informatics became the discipline we know as biodiversity informatics today. It is where all the previous efforts coalesced and came together in a coordinated and collaborative whole. To me, it is the period when our science moved from incremental advances to exponential advances. In the past, we did research. We eventually published that research. Sometime later, another researcher would read the paper and begin their own research, building on the earlier work and eventually publishing that and so on and so forth. And this way, our science advanced in increments over long periods. During the 1990s and later, we began international collaborations where we worked together on a problem, including with vast new collaboratively distributed data sources to find solutions. And when these were published, including electronically, we were far further ahead in a shorter time than we would, than we would otherwise have been. This to me has been one of the greatest outcomes of the science we are now calling biodiversity informatics and it began in the 1990s. In many ways, what is happening could be regarded as an example of social networking theory. Now that is not to say that it can't be vastly improved and I look forward to later talks in this series that may look ahead to where we can take this, this discipline. As mentioned earlier, the Prime Minister of Australia, in a talk on Our Country, Our Future, announced the establishment of Erin in 1989. The government also established a parallel organisation in the Agriculture and Resources Department, ENRIC, and tasked the two organisations to develop their systems on compatible platforms and to exchange information. Erin was established to draw together, upgrade and supplement information on the distribution of endangered species vegetation types and heritage sites. It was established with initial funding of $1.8 million and with $2.1 million in subsequent years. Erin took over the funding of the herbarium and mu museum databasing projects by establishing fixed contracts for the supply of data as opposed to grants. It was important in these contracts that the rights of the data custodians were maintained and that data providing institutions were appropriately acknowledged. Over the next three years, Erin funded a num number of large databasing projects concentrating on key land cover taxa, eucalypts, acacias, grasses, etc., providing over $700,000 and resulting in nearly 1 million database records, all with georeferences. In the review of Erin in 1994, it was shown how the funding from Erin was acting as a catalyst for additional databasing efforts in the herbaria. In 1991, as part of this process, Erin developed a technique for detecting outliers in environmental as well as geographic space by using a reverse jackknifing technique, which is used extensively around the world to this day. Regular data cut quality reports were provided back to the data providers on suspect records and data errors. Now reverse jackknifing exaggerates outliers rather than reduces them as in normal jackknifing algorithms and was used to identify outliers in environmental space as well as geographic space such as latitudes, longitudes and altitude etc. The publication of the hard copy version of the Australian Plant Name Index in 1991 with details on over 64,000 names and the later release on, of the online database, initially on Gopher in 1993, led a vast stabilisation of the names of the Australian herbarium databases. 
This was the first such database of its type anywhere in the world and contributed to world databases such as the National Plant Names Index and the Catalogue of Life, with around 90% of the taxa being endemic to Australia. The Zoological Catalogue of Australia was also rapidly expanding to cover mammals, fish, reptiles and amphibians, as well as many invertebrate groups, and was providing a similar platform for databasing of the museum collections. <coughs> Internationally, other countries were establishing Erin equivalents. In Costa Rica, INBIO was established in 1989, Canabio in Mexico in 1992, and in Brazil, the forerunner of CREA was established as a private agency as part of the base de Dados Tropical in the state of Sao Paulo. And there were others. Each of these operated in ways that suited their own countries and regions, but in the early stages, it was agreed to work together and exchange technologies and information wherever possible. At the Earth Summit in March 1992 in Rio de Janeiro, Agenda 21 made a major statement on the gap in the availability of data for environmental decision makers between the developed and the developing world. For example, in Chapter 40.3 it stated, there is a general lack of capacity, particularly in developing countries and in many areas at the international level, for the collection and assessment of data, for their transformation into useful information and for their dissemination. There is also need for improved coordination among environmental, demographic, social and development, developmental data and information activities. Early in 1993, Erin, and the Tropical Countries Biodiversity Network comprising Canabio, Inbio, the Kenya National Museums and Lippi in Indonesia hosted a two-week international workshop on designing spatial database systems to manage biodiversity information. Dan Jansen organised USAID funding to bring, to bring developing country participants to the meeting, which was attended by many international biodiversity data management experts from both developing and developed nations. The meeting spent two weeks intensively examining all aspects of the ERIN system, databasing, remote sensing, modelling and analysis, communications, GIS, mapping, quality control, etc. And looking at how these may be applied, not only within their own institutions and countries, but internationally within collaborative networks. The workshop was designated the WOW, Window of Opportunity Workshop by Dan Jansen. Some point to this meeting as being the real beginning of biodiversity informatics. In 1992, Harvard University launched the Biodiversity in Biocollections GOFA. It included Flora, an electronic botanical journal, and later the Grey Herbarium with over 587,000 records of New World vascular plant taxa. In 1993, the first specimen images were released on, on the GOFA initially with 188 images. <coughs> a workshop on the needs and specifications for a biodiversity information network held at the Tropical Database in Campinas in Brazil in 1992 was attended by 35 people from a number of international organisations. It was made available online through a variety of electronic networks. Not easy in those days, I can assure you and which was accessed by, some, accessed by some 200 people, 30 of whom sent contributions to the discussions. This workshop established the Biodiversity Information Network, or BIN21. In 1994, a second meeting in Brazil with representatives of a number of national data groups, including BDT in Brazil, ERIN and the Australian National Botanic Gardens in Australia, INBIO, Costa Rica, Canabio in Mexico, FinBIN in Finland, and BioBanco, in Ecuador, as well as a number of individuals representing countries without established biodiversity data networks, consolidated the network. Goals included the exchange of information by electronic means wherever possible, be a distributed network that link many different sources of information across the world, allowing efforts and resources to be shared, and to actively encourage the open exchange of information on a worldwide basis and encourage standardisation of a methodology of information exchange in collaboration with existing networks. And there are a whole lot of other goals. 
Other international initiatives around this time, many arising out of the Agenda 21, included a meeting in Delphi in Greece in 1990 to discuss a design for a global plant species information system called GYPSIS. An international forum in Montreal, Canada in 1991 on environmental information for the 21st century. A meeting of the International Union of Biological Sciences in Canberra, Australia in September 1991 with associated meetings of TADWIC as well as IOPI, the National Organisation for Plant Information, a follow-on from GYPSIS. A conference held in association with the above meeting discussed databasing diversity, the role of specimen-backed information in environmental decision-making. In 1994, Systematics Agenda 2000 was published and was des designed to set a research agenda for 25-year period across areas of basic and applied systematics. New methods for species distribution or niche modelling as it became known were being developed, examined and extensively used in Australia. In 1991, Anya Klim version one was published by Mark Hutchinson of the Australian National University. This used thin plate, formerly Laplacian, smoothing spline surface fitting algorithms to improve the resolution of climate and, and environmental grids. These were first used to develop new climate surfaces for Australia, Sub-Saharan Africa and Papua New Guinea, and later extended to other parts of the world. The Anuclim algorithms were later, around about 2000, used by Robert Hymans and others to develop the World Klim database producing climate grids covering all terrestrial areas of the world. BioClim was expanded to include more parameters as well as using criteria such as rainfall for the warmest and coolest months, temperature of the wettest and coolest quarters, etc. And these were determined to be better environmental driving variables for predicting plant and animal distributions than the raw monthly maximums and minimums for rainfall and temperature. GLIM generalised linear modelling and GAM generalised additive modelling techniques had also been published and were extensively tested by CSIRO, at CSIRO by Mike Austin and others on high quality as well as artificial data sets. These prove excellent in areas where good data, as well as both presence and absence data, was available. In 1991, Aaron funded Dave Stockwell at the Australian National University to continue his work to develop GARP, Genetic Algorithms for Rural Production, which later proved a popular methodology, especially in South America. The Australian National University was testing a range of other methodologies, including neural networks, decision trees, and the use of remotely sensed vegetation data. In 1992, Aaron began using the BioClim software to examine the impacts of global warming on the potential distributions of 57 threatened vertebrate species using present day climate, as well as three climate change scenarios. Results were rather alarming with 82 to 84% of species studied showing a contraction in their core climate habitat for all three scenarios. A later study used updated global climate models and looked at a range of important land cover plant species, large ranging animal species, such as some of the kangaroos, etc., as well as re-looking at some of the threatened species and new soils as well as climate in the analysis. You can see in the associated image of the Kawari that under even a mild climate change scenario two, the potential habitat is nowhere near its current distribution and where suitable climate habitat occurs, the soils are totally unsuitable, it being a burrowing animal and can't dig into rocky ground. Also in 1992, Erin began developing a biogeographic regionalisation of Australia using vegetation, species and environmental modelling. The Interim Biogeographic Regionalisation of Australia was published in 1994. This regionalisation formed the basis of an extensive conservation planning exercise with the plan to conserve at least 10% of each vegetation type as identified through the bioregionalisation. Later, fish distributions, water attributes and benthic substrates were used to develop the associated interim marine regionalisation of Australia, INCRA. 
At this time, Erin also began monitoring the national environment from space using NDVI, the Natural Difference Vegetation Index. This was carried out on a two weekly basis and in the early days aggregated over each month to help mitigate the effects of cloud cover. In 1992-1993, the World Wide Web was, re was released, and this changed the landscape upon which we worked. David Green at the Australian National University established one of the first 20 servers in the world in mid-1992 with his bioinformatics site. By November 1993, there were six sites in Australia, three of which were bi biodiversity informatics servers. Erin released its server in August of 1993 and was one of the first 200 such servers worldwide. <coughs> A November 1993 version of the register lists the following Australian servers. The Australian National Botanic Gardens, the ANU Bioinformatics site, Erin, the Victorian Institute of Forensic Pathology, the Mount Stromlo Observatory, and the Bassett Department of Computing Science at the University of Sydney. In March of 1993, Aaron took two of the modelling methodologies mentioned earlier, BioClim and GARP, and using data on important land cover taxa compiled from the Australian Herbaria, developed a prototype online modelling system using the Gopher protocol. This was later, this was rather rudimentary in its presentation as it used ASCII characters to depict the maps, locality data and predictions, circles and X's and dashes and things like that to draw the maps. Immediately after Erin set up its World Wide Web server, it migrated its modelling across from Gopher and was now able to include coloured maps in the output, a vast improvement of what was possible using Gopher. A paper was presented by Tony Boston and Dave Stockwell at the second World Wide Web Conference in Chicago in September 1994, explaining the technology behind the scenes. Incidentally, that meeting was the same meeting that Tim Berners-Lee presented his URL paper. I guess in many ways you could say that Erin gambled on the World Wide Web at the time, as the technology was extremely new and unproven but staff at Erin embraced it as a technology that fitted very well with all they were doing at the time. Because of its innovative approach, Erin won two major awards in 1993-94, the Smithsonian Computer World Award and the Technology and Government Gold Award. Towards the end of the decade, a range of techniques was developed to use species and environmental diversity in conservation planning. This introduced the concept of representativeness, comprehensiveness and irreplaceability, as well as the idea of using phylogenetic and environmental diversity. Dan Faith introduced the concept of phylogenetic diversity in conservation evaluation and planning in 1992. And in June 93, he and Walker released version one of the software package diversity for sampling phylogenetic, phylogenetic and environmental diversity. Lee Bell, Lee Belbin published the Pattern, Pattern Analysis software in 1994, which was used for analysing complex multivariate data sets. Lupus used ranking of competing candidate land uses or management regimes and facilities for multi-stakeholder driven approach to resource allocation that built upon resource inventory and evaluation. Metapopulation models, maximise metapopulation persistence in a conservation planning framework. And Mark San is used predominantly for marine systematic reserve planning and is the most widely used systematic reserve planning software in the world. In 1995, the World Bank and AusAid supported a project to integrate a range of software and techniques into a package for rapid biodiversity assessment, BioRap. This project brought together CSIRO, Erin, Cress at the ANU and the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. <coughs> the package was to include guidelines in carrying out rapid assessment, as well as databasing, mapping and spatial modelling tools and software, such as Aneuclim, Pattern and Diversity. A successful trial of the package was conducted in Papua New Guinea. 
Databasing of information became much more efficient in the 1990s with the increased use, especially in the biological world, of relational database management systems, a structured query language. At a meeting in Tadwig in Jalapa, Mexico in October 1992, discussion centered around databasing of collections and entity relationship diagrams in database design. I remember a number of participants whipping out ER diagrams showing their database designs to the uninitiated, looking more like complex wiring diagrams than practical working plans, but an essential step in the move towards relational databases. Some of those early su successful data models included the ASC data model, facilitated by Stan Bloom in the USA, following a number of workshops hosted by Cornell University, the Australian National Botanic Gardens data model, developed by Jim Croft and Greg Whitbread, and the Berlin Botanic Gardens data model developed by Walter Berenson. Geographic information systems, GIS, also moved from being largely command-line-driven, driven, command line driven, difficult to use systems that required complex programming to systems with WYSIWYG interfaces. This brought a whole lot of new users into the field and mapping and analysis of data was made much easier and user-friendly. <coughs> New initiatives were being established internationally. In 1993, the European Environment Agency was established. 1995, CTAF, the Consortium of European Taxonomic Facilities, was formed. And in 1995, the World Conservation Monitoring Centre launched the Biodiversity Data Management Program. With additional support, WCM team WCMC teams delivered training in biodiversity information management in numerous countries over the next few years, including to Canabia. Again, in 1995, the G7 developed a pilot project on environmental and natural resource management with, aim, with the aim of, to develop an international environment data directory, a metadata directory, to be available via the web using the Z3950 protocol. <coughs> At the conference, at the Biodiversity Convention Conference of the Parties in Jakarta, Indonesia in 1995, there were discussions on the establishment of a global biodiversity and conservation database for a clearinghouse mechanism. Much of the discussion centered around whether such a database should be centralized within the Biodiversity Convention Secretariat or be distributed. The BIN 21 group had prepared a comprehensive document setting out the arguments for a distributed database model. Now, although this document was not able to be tabled at the COP, as it was not prepared by a party to the convention, it nevertheless proved an, an important unofficial document in and out of dis meeting discussions, in out of meeting discussions. The document set an important platform for a distributed databasing model that eventually led to distributed platforms such as those adopted by GBIF, the Atlas of Living Australia, and the Ocean's Biodiversity Information System. 1996 was an important year for international initiatives. I won't go into details as I'm sure Jorge Soberon will elaborate on them further in the next talk in this series. The most important of these was the establishment in January of the OECD Mega Science Forum Working Group on Biodiversity Informatics, which later recommended the establishment of GBIT. Later in the year, IABIN was officially mandated at the Summit of the Americas on Sustainable Development, and in 1997, OBIS, the Ocean's Biodiversity Information Network, was established as a project under the Census of Marine Life. In 1996, the Integrated Taxonomic Information System was formed as an interagency group within the US federal government. In the same year, Species 2000 was launched as a legal entity in Britain. Both of these organisations were tasked at databasing names of plants and animals and later came together to produce the annual Catalogue of Life published series, as well as a monthly updated online version. These now form the basis of the names architecture in GBIF. Another standard that proved important for biodiversity informatics was a standard development developed by libraries and used for interchanging bibliographic references and for interlibrary catalogue searches. Z3950 or Z3950 for you Americans, an ISO standard, was an international client server communications protocol for database searching and retrieval of information. 
It was adapted for use in biodiversity by Dave V. Glias at the University of Kansas, who, adopted, who adapted the protocol to develop DIGGER. More of that later. Darwin Core was also created as a Z3950 protocol. Tadwood continued to develop important biodiversity information standards. In 1996, it formally adopted HISPID 3 as a standard for data interchange. In 1998, Darwin Core was established as a Z3950 protocol. <clears throat> Between 2001 and 2003, discussions and presentations were made of DIGA in Sydney, in Dayatuba, and California. Between 2000 and 2004, discussions on the ABC access to biological collection data were held predominantly in Europe. And in 2005, that standard was adopted. In 2005 also, the, the, the Structured Descriptive Data Standard, SDD, was adopted, and this was an expansion of the earlier Delta Standard. In 1994, Fish Gopher, a collaboration between freestanding museums and university collections in the development of open access biological collection community databases, was funded by the National Science Foundation. It was initially launched as a collaboration between eight fish collections in the USA. <coughs> 1997, the Commission for Environmental Cooperation began discussions about North American wide data sharing. <coughs> and following the BDM project by WMC, WCMC, the European Environment Agency and others published the WCMC handbooks on biodiversity information management in seven volumes. In 1998, the US Gap Analysis Program was established. And in September of that year, Distributed Information Network for an Avian Biodiversity Data was funded by the National Science Foundation. In 2001, the Mammal Network Information System, MANIS, was introduced to the American Society of Mammalogists, and this was an important step in that it was the catalyst for the development of a number of new georeferencing tools. In 1999, the Australian government rewrote its environmental legislation and enacted the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. Erin then developed a comprehensive environmental decision support system to support the act. This involved mapping and modelling around 3,500 species of significance, including all threatened plant and animal species, important marine species, cetaceans and migratory species. All models are individually peer reviewed by species experts and all changes fully documented through change tracking methodologies. This information along with protected areas, world heritage boundaries and many other criteria were made available online to proponents of development, environmental staff, NGOs and politicians, as well as the general public to provide a fully transparent system of assessment. Following its development, Erin won a second Government in Technology Gold Award. Now, this is an area where I feel we should be doing a lot more in developing comprehensive decision support systems to make our data more available and usable to potential users. Code developed by a research group at the University of Adelaide and the State Herbarium of South Australia with help from KE Software and others developed a prototype known as the Virtual Australian Herbarium. An early demonstration produced Australian-wide distribution maps of acacia species, sourcing data from specimen databases in the Adelaide Herbarium, the Perth Herbarium, the Sydney Herbarium and in Canberra, and led to funding of $10 million for specimen data capture. This was later renamed the Australian Virtual Herbarium and currently includes around 7 million specimen records of plants, algae and fungi. In the state of Sao Paulo in Brazil, the Sao Paulo Research Foundation, FAPESPI, established the Biota Research Program, Biota FAPESPI, on biodiversity characterisation, conservation, restoration and sustainable use aim not only at discovering, mapping and analysing the origins, diversity and distribution of the flora and fauna of the state of Sao Paulo, but also at evaluating the possibilities for sustainable exploitation of plants or animals with economic potential and assisting in the formulation of conservation policies on forest remnants. 
The program funds biodiversity research in the state and funded CREA, the Reference Centre for Environmental Information, to develop such programs as Species Link, a collaborative project to database the state's biological collections, and now includes the participation of hundreds of biological collections in Brazil and abroad. Symbiota, an environmental information system for the state of Sao Paulo, developed to host data from inventories and surveys carried out by the Biota FAPESPI program. It is now managed by the University of Campinas or UNICAMP. Biota Neotropica, an electronic journal published in three languages, English, Portuguese and Spanish, and which publishes results of original research concerned with conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity in the neotropics. Many of these programs have been expanded to cover the whole of Brazil with funding from the Brazil Federal Government. Now, it would be remiss of me not to mention LifeMapper. LifeMapper began in the early 2000, in early 2000, with the aim of mapping the world's species diversity. It uses distributed computer networks utilising the resources of individuals and the combined, combined computing power of desktops around the world to prepare distribution models from online data distributed databases. Now in concluding this talk, I would like to explore briefly why it was that Australia and developing countries such as Mexico, Brazil and Costa Rica took such a lead in the early years of biodiversity informatics. Australia has a large land mass and a very small population. Most of that population is concentrated within 50 kilometres of the coast, leaving vast areas of land a long way from any scientific institution. The map shows the red spots as 50% of the Australian population. Similarly, Brazil and Mexico, although having large populations, have a relatively small scientific population, and again, large areas of land a long way from any scientific institution. The three countries also have relatively small scientific collections compared to their land masses. I once estimated that in Australia, there was less than one plant collection in the herbaria for each square mile of land. <coughs> As can be seen in this slide, there are huge data gaps in Australia and Brazil when compared to the United States, all three countries having com comparable land areas. In the US, with a population of 292 million, there are between half and one billion collections in its many museums in Herbaria. Also for its size, its biodiversity is low compared to both Brazil and Australia. It also has a relatively high and geographically spread scientific population. If we look at Brazil, again with a large population but a relatively small scientific population, it only has around 50 million collections, less than 10% of the USA, but with three times as many plants, species, twice as many reptiles, and perhaps 10 times as many insect species. Australia, by contrast, has a small population and a correspondingly small scientific population. It only has around 35 million collections, about 5% of the USA, but with approximately the same number of plant species and double the number of reptiles and insect species. Australia being an island also has a huge marine area of responsibility. So early on, it was decided that we were not likely to make up for the short fall in collections in a hurry. So we had to get smarter with our science. We had to use technology to overcome the lack of collections and data. And thus we saw the need to develop modelling tools such as BioClim and GARP, as well as conservation planning tools such as Lupus, MarkSan, Pattern and Biodiversity. And, diversity, and descriptive data tools such as Delta and Lucid. Also we had to get smarter about the way we conducted our surveys. Many of our collections, especially in remote arid areas, were along roads. And in much of Australia, a map of collections was a good surrogate for a map of the road network. So were these roads a good collecting transect or were they adding huge biases to the collections? Again, we could use species or niche modelling, firstly, to check the adequacy of such transect collecting, and secondly, to plan further survey work, not based on geography alone, but on environmental analysis. Part of getting smarter was to spend resources for survey wise, wisely, so data gaps were identified, not just geographically, but by using environmental attributes. This is an example of a survey in the Cape York Peninsula of Australia, 
and used eucalypt records in 20 environmental domains. In this slide, four environmental domains are shown with an accumulation of eucalyptus collections over time. You can see that the second and third domains are way under collected compared to the other two, and any new collection is likely to envisage collection of a taxa new to that area. An example of one of the species accumulation curves showing species collected over time. And this graph shows collection versus annual mean precipitation and shows that classes two and four are relatively poorly collected compared to other classes. The map shows where those classes occur. And although class two looks well collected geographically, environmentally it is not. When we did this study, we had helicopters available to fly out to these areas and make new collections immediately. Now, I can't leave this talk without a brief mention of the Atlas of Living Australia. However, I won't go into it in any depth as it falls into the next decade that Jorge Sobron will cover in more detail. The Atlas of Living Australia adopted and adapted many of the lessons from ABRS and Erin and linked the Australian Biodiversity Research Institutions to form a truly distributed data information and analysis system. ALA is built upon open source platforms and the code upon which it is based is being adopted by many countries to form their own national biodiversity atlases. These include Spain, France, Portugal, Brazil, and Argentina. Brazil and Mexico face similar problems to Australia as mentioned earlier, and adapted many of the same techniques as well as developing others to overcome the collecting biases and lack of information. In all three countries and in Costa Rica, a large proportion of the collections made in the country were housed outside the host country. So data repatriation has been a big issue. Many problems still exist, and I'm sure biodiversity informatics as a science will become even more important in the future than it already is today. So I'd like to thank you all for listening, and I thank Town Peterson for planning and organising this series of talks. And I look forward to the subsequent talks from Jorge Somberon and John Majoric over the next two months. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arthur. That was great. Um, everybody, we've got the opportunity for questions for Arthur. I'm going to go ahead and share a screen that gives you the email address. So you can send questions to biodivtraining at gmail.com. Um, I'll also mention to you that on the 25th of February, Jorge Soberon will give us biodiversity informatics history part two, and I've given some of the time equivalencies for that talk uh, on this screen. So Arthur, meantime, again, I'm hoping that people will send questions in. Um, but meantime, I do have two questions for you. Uh, and one is looking backwards and the other is looking forwards. Uh, looking backwards, <clears throat> if you could take one little detail, one paper, one analysis, one insight, and give it to yourself or to others 25 or 30 years ago, what would you give them? What would you, what would you pass on? Mm. <laughs> That's a difficult question. Um, I think looking back, the importance of um, standards and indexes as being, to me, the way to go. Um, when we, a lot of countries have started this pro process, they haven't had a decent index of the names and the taxa that are available upon which to build their information. Australia was very blessed in it having the Australian Plant Name Index and the Zoological Catalogue of Australia. Uh, on which to base their databases and their information. But I guess the other thing is on data quality. I just don't think we're still to this day doing enough about data quality. And just recently I heard someone saying, we've got money to database, but we don't have any money to, um, to fix up any of the errors in the data. My view has always been if you're going to spend money on databasing and you're not interested in the quality of that data, then you may not 
there's no, no advantage at all in databasing it at, at, at all. So I think we need to uh, make sure that we have better ways of managing the quality of our data and we I look forward to the next stages in that process. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, I think I would share that same viewpoint that, you know, more and more I hear colleagues who have very, very deep analytical powers who say, oh, yeah, but those data online, I don't trust them. They're too dirty. And so in, unless, unless there's a major initiative aimed at cleaning and cleaning data and flagging data that hold inconsistencies and you've been a champion of this for decades um, as you say there's a point where you you say well why bother unless you're willing to put in the time to clean up and assure high quality data uh, one other question for you Arthur this this um, looking forward uh, you've covered kind of the the early period, and I think it was it was ideal because you kind of overlapped into this century and some of the newer things just enough that there'll be continuity between part one and part two and part three. But any suggestions for Jorge uh, next month and John the month after that, as far as topics that you really hope they don't miss? Hmm. Um, well, I hope I haven't overlapped too much with Jorge and uh, and John. But, no, um, I think it's perfect. <laughs> I think um, with Jorge, I'm I'm sure he's going to cover the uh, the globalization aspects of it, the GBIF and OBIS and um, IABIN and all these other networks. Um, but I think we also need the importance of some of the things like. Tadwig and where it's been going over the last uh, 15 years um, and um, mm, I think Jorge knows that that uh, topic well enough for me not to have to add too much to him and give him too much uh, too many suggestions I think he's got that covered and I just hope John uh, which Eric really um, covers so some of the, the the interchanging standards and things that he's been involved with right from the start, and I'm sure he will with Digger and and Darwin Core and um, and all these other processes, as well as the uh, the techniques for um, managing georeferencing and um, and data standards and and looking at data quality that he's been involved with so much, and I'm sure he will cover that without. Any suggestions from me as well? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I think we've yeah. we've given people the opportunity to ask questions, and I have to say, if there's one thing that I don't like about this this online seminar format, it's that we don't get as many questions to really good speakers as I would like. But um, are everybody who's out there around the world, you are welcome to send questions. And I assume that Arthur and our other history speakers will will do their best to uh, answer those as they come in. Uh, but more importantly, Arthur, a big thank you for your time and your energy invested in putting together this this panorama. Um, you've you've made a, a huge contribution to uh, a piece of of this field that I think has been neglected so far. Thank you. Thank you, Town, and thank you so much for putting this together. I hope that uh, eventually we can publish a paper coming out of all this because I I think it's, it would be good to have it down in hard copy somewhere or electronically. I agree. <laughs> exactly. I agree completely. And I will harass and hound you and Jorge and John to make sure that that happens. Uh, Thank you again, and I welcome everybody next month to hear Horkley, but thanks, Arthur, for this contribution. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Yeah.